lot of fun right there, son. That'll make me sing in the choir. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate the, I appreciate the way you guys laughed when I said makes me want to sing in the choir. I just uh, <laughs> nothing like being honest, amen. amen. Well, I uh, I just got to tell you this morning as uh, as I've gone through our times of worship, it's been sweet to just think about how when we pray and we trust in God, uh, God just does miracles and He makes a way for us. This past week, um, a family in our church, um, their son had been in an in in an induced coma. And he was trying to fight off an infection. Well, the doctors called um, the parents and said, listen, uh, your son has 24 hours to live. And so they called me and they said, Pastor, will you just pray with us? Uh, We're on our way to the hospital. I said, absolutely. So we prayed together and prayed for a miracle. And and the mother of that young man just said, "Uh, I'm trusting that God's going to just heal him. I'm trusting that God's going to do a miracle. And so we called on the name of the Lord our God. And, and, uh, about 24 hours later, that mom called me back and, and said, I just want you to know, Pastor, God's done a miracle. And said, uh, not only is he getting better. Yeah, y'all can clap for that. Um, not only was that young man getting better, um, his whole physical uh, condition had turned around. He had come out of the coma, was alert, was responsive, and God was taking him on a way to just a, a great healing victory. And so, as we have just sung this morning, I just have gone back to that and replayed that reality um, for us as, as just a person and as a church. God really does hear when we call out to Him, and God really does make a way when we put our faith and our trust in Him. And so as we gather together this morning, man, let's celebrate that God that not only created everything, but creates a way and makes a way for us in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us, and then let's study God's Word together. Father God, as we gather together today, Lord, we ask You to just continue to do miracles in our lives. God, I pray for this uh, amazing church. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd let it make a difference in this community. God, I pray that we would witness to our friends and we would witness to our neighbors. And God, our co-workers and, and neighbors would come to faith in Christ. God, I pray that our friends and family would come to faith in Christ. And God, I pray that you would raise up uh, in this community, in this county, in these days, Lord, a work of God that is bigger than any one person. It's bigger than any one congregation. And God, may you get the glory in all of that. And so, Father God, make a way, move mountains, use us, and God, build us into the people that you want us to be, Lord, for your glory and for the sake of your kingdom, Father. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, take your Bibles out. Turn me to the second chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2 this morning. And that's going to be our launching off point this morning. Um, I'm excited to begin a series of messages today um, to help refresh you. I think the message today is a message that I need. Um, I think it's a message that many of you need. In fact, it's a message, according to statistics, that 84 million Americans need. Uh, According to statistics, 84 million Americans struggle getting a good night's sleep every night. Anybody want to confess to being one of the 84 million? Amen. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in our life... uh, uh, regularly on, uh, on the evening times, I wake up about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. My wife has already woken up. She's on her phone, and the, the screen is on. She can't get back to bed, and, uh, and then I wake up because the screen is on, and I'm like, baby, can you go back to bed? She's like, I can't go back to bed. So I roll over, and I'm like, okay, well, have fun. I'm trying to go back to bed. And that's just something that we've had to deal with in our lives over the last little bit, just as we get older and as we go through the aging process. Um, And I think that's the reality for a lot of us. A lot of us um, are are reaching a point where we're struggling to get a good night's rest. And so I want to help you today. Uh, I want to talk about rest biblically. And I want to begin by just sharing with you some hacks to help you get a good night's rest. So let me just jump right on out and give you six things that you can try to do uh, to help you get a better night's sleep. Number one, establish a wind-down routine. I think it's important, and uh, this uh, article says that it's important that you learn to kind of begin the, the going to bed process and begin cultivating uh, a routine that you do every night that kind of gets you to sleep. Uh, don't just kind of be going full speed and try and cut it off immediately. That's not a good way to go to sleep. Secondly, it says follow a consistent sleep schedule. Now, i got to confess, that's me. I'm a very regimented person. I like to go to bed at one time and uh, wake up at, at one time and then go to bed uh, at the same time every night. Uh, in fact, we, we've kind of adopted uh, Christy's dad's uh, going to bed thing. Christy's dad, I remember like clockwork, would as soon as law and order would go off, 
Papa Daddy would get up, turn the TV off, and, and walk out of the room going to bed. And I was like, it didn't matter if I was over there visiting with Christy. Like, he was like, I'm done. See ya. And he'd turn the, turn the TV out on us. And I'd look at Christy like, what just happened? She's like, I guess it's bedtime. Papa's going to sleep. And so uh, he had that consistent sleep schedule. Uh, number three, it says set a food and drink curfew. That's something my wife has actually been doing really well recently. I'm not so good at that. Uh, I tend to have a flexible schedule, and so I sometimes eat later on in the evening and at night, and uh, that doesn't bode well for me going to sleep and getting off to sleep, yet it does help when you can set a food and drink curfew and you stop eating and drinking earlier in the evening so that your body has the time to process that food and be ready to go to bed. Number four, it says incorporate movement into your day. Exercise. Tire your body out so at the end of the, <clears throat> at the, end of the day, your body is ready to go to sleep. It's, it's got a reason to go to sleep. Number five, keep your sleeping environment cool. Keep your sleeping environment. Anybody like a cold room at night? Yeah. Baby, you like a cold room at night, don't you? Every night when we go to bed, she turns the AC down in our room. And then she turns the fan on as well. Amen? 20 plus years of marriage from night one. The fan has been on, hasn't it, babe? I, I just want you to know, I'm still praying for the moment she's going to concede and give me 20 years of no fan. We haven't reached that day yet, have we, babe? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't matter how cold she cranks the AC down, right? She still turns the fan on and freezes me out. Amen? Guys, you with me? All right, hey, it's better to have a happy wife, right? Yeah, sleep cold, use covers. Um, the article actually says 65 degrees to 72 degrees is the secret. Somewhere between 65 and 72. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny that so many of you are like, absolutely, yes. I'm like, we are having a dialogue now. I'm not preaching. All right. And then last but not least, number six, get sunlight first thing in the morning. Uh, I can tell you that, it, man, it helps me wake up. The, the sooner I can get to the sunlight... The more I, I get that sunlight on my skin, the easier it is for me to jump out of bed and wake up. And that is just a good part about, uh, about getting me out of, out of that sleep schedule and, and into moving on in my life. And those are some things that you can do too to help you get a better night's rest. Now, I want to talk to you biblically about rest this morning. I think that this is a message that I need. I think this is a message that a lot of us need. And I think it's something that will help us refresh. Over the summer... I want to share some things that I have done in my own personal life when I go on sabbatical to help me refresh. And so, uh, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to hide anything over the next few weeks, but I want to walk you through some things that, that when I have been ministering and I've been laboring and, and expending for the Lord, and it's time for me to really focus on getting refreshed, these are the things that I, I focus on during that sabbatical period to help me um, just refresh and revive and become uh, more of what God wants me to be so that I can engage in the work that God has for me to. And I think these are good principles for us um, as a church and as individuals to learn. So let's read together Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were uh, completed in all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Underline that phrase, he rested. He rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested. Underline that phrase, he rested. He rested from all his work, which God had created and made. What I want you to see this morning is that God demonstrated rest to his people and commanded rest from his people. And so here in Genesis chapter 2, we see the first part of that phrase being lived out, and that is that God demonstrated rest to his people. Now, the term translated rest is the term Shabbat, Shabbat. And that, that is a word that we kind of pronounce a little bit differently. We call it Sabbath. We pronounce it Sabbath. And what the word Sabbath means is it means to rest or to cease from work, to stop working. It can even be translated and occasionally is translated to celebrate, to celebrate. Now I find that interesting because when God finished creating everything and God looked at everything that he had created, he did a celebration. He actually looked at it and he said, it is what? 
He said, man, it's good. He celebrated what he had done. And when we celebrate a Sabbath, we stop doing what we typically do. We, we complete a work, and what we need to do is look back and say, man, that was good. And so we need to stop, we need to rest, and we need to celebrate. Now, as we understand what's going on in this passage, let me tell you a few things, okay? God did not rest because he was tired, weary, or in need of refreshing. God had not diminished in power or ability. When we look at this passage, it's not that God all of a sudden became less God or, or God had lost some of his ability and needed to refresh it or recharge himself. God's power is limitless. God's power is undiminishing. Okay, when God rested here, it wasn't because of his, uh, a change in his ability. It was so that he could demonstrate for you and I as human beings a work-rest cycle. God was establishing and modeling a work-rest cycle for human life. That's how we should live our lives. Okay, we should work and then we should rest. Now, for all of the type A personalities in here, okay, all of the driven, goal-getting, make it, get it done, kind of Larry the Cable guy, right? Get it done, right? For all of us who are like that, we think work, work. We think work and keep working. We, we think work and, and man, pound it out. But that's not biblical. That is not the way that God has ordained for you and I to operate as human beings. God has not built into us as human beings a work, work cycle. God has built into the way we are to operate a work, rest cycle. This is the biblical way to live our lives. This is the blessed way to live our lives. This is the way that you and I need to make sure we operate um, in everything that we do. And not only did he establish and model the work rest cycle for human life, look at what it says he did. He rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. God was blessing and sanctifying the seventh day. By blessing it, what we see is that God was promising good things to come from it. When God blessed the seventh day, he said, listen, when you honor the Sabbath, when you experience the Sabbath, when you let the Sabbath be what the Sabbath should be for you, it will bring good to you. There will be blessings that come from it. There will be favor that comes from it. There will be benefit that comes from it when you use the Sabbath rest the way it's intended to be, there'll be blessings to come. But not only did he bless it, he sanctified it. And so by sanctifying it, God was making it a holy day. Thus, it is a day that demands connection and focus on him. I can't tell you how many people I meet that want to claim to be Christians, and they claim that they don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Now listen to me. On the surface, that is a true statement. You do not have to go to church to be a Christian. The thief on the cross, all right, because of his faith, became a Christian. And, and because he died that day on the cross, he never went to church. But listen, you should go to church if you're a Christian. Amen. You don't have to go to church to become one, but you should go to one if you aren't one. That's not good grammar, but that's good preaching. Okay? <laughs> And the reason why you should want to go to church and, and you should want to come on the Sabbath day, on the seventh day, the day that God has sanctified, is because it's a holy day. It is a day where we should focus on God. It is a day where we should look back and celebrate who God is. We should look back on all that God has done in the previous week since we were last gathered together and we should go, man, I want to connect with that God. I want to know that God. I want that God to work in my life and I want that God to be the focus of my life and so we gather on this day and we stop working on this day so that we are not distracted from focusing on him and connecting with him it is a day of Sabbath rest of stopping our work and connecting and communing with him in fact if you turn with me to Exodus chapter 20 in Exodus chapter 20 this Sabbath is talked about and a command is given in Exodus chapter 20. 
In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In fact, it doesn't just stop there. In fact, it goes on to say, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. There is a command in Exodus chapter 20 for the Israelites to keep the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath. In other words, the people of God that know God and worship God should remember the seventh day, how God worked and then God Sabbath. He rested, he stopped, he celebrated. It's a command. The New Testament teaches us that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one that is sovereign over this day. And not only that, Jesus also said in that same passage, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, it's not us that are created to do something on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is, is, uh, is the focus he says, no, the Sabbath is something that I've created on my focus, which is humanity. Sabbath is something that God has ordained to do something for us. God wants the Sabbath to bless and to consecrate and set us apart. And so as we gather together today, we need to understand that God demonstrated rest to his people by resting on the seventh day. Now, I also want you to see that God rested, and I want you to see that we need rest. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 is just an incredible story um, that, that I love uh, so much. It's one of these Bible stories that I think has got so much that we can learn from. And what we really learn from it is that we need rest. And God commands rest from His people. Now, before we read 1 Kings 19 verses 1 through 8, let me give you some context. Okay, Elijah, the prophet of God, has been ministering to God's people as a prophet during the reign of a terrible king, King Ahab. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel are disobedient and wicked people. They don't, they don't worship God and they definitely don't like Elijah. They've established their own prophets or false prophets. They've instituted their own religion and they're leading the nation uh, of Israel to worship the, these false gods. Now, Elijah has just confronted uh, Ahab and Jezebel and all of the false prophets, 450 of them. He's confronted them and he, he wanted to see which God was the real God. And so it was 450 against one. All 450 prophets, they were going to offer a sacrifice. Um, uh, Elijah was going to offer a sacrifice and whichever God showed up by fire was going to be determined to be the one true God. And so early in the morning, 450 prophets, they put a sacrifice on an altar and they start to pray to their false gods and they're praying and they're praying and they're doing all of this crazy stuff and they're trying to get their false gods to show up by fire and nothing happens. No false gods appear. Late in the afternoon, Elijah says, enough's enough. He says, it's my turn. And he offers his sacrifice. But before he lights it on fire and, and he calls down fire from heaven, he says, look, I'm going to put water on my sacrifice. And so he offers a sacrifice and then he put, puts water on it, so much water that it fills up a trough around the altar. And when he prays to the God of creation, when he prays to the God of Sabbath, that God shows up by fire and burns up everything. The, the altar, the offering, the water burns it all up. And in that divine moment of great victory, Elijah says, listen, get all the prophets and kill them all. And they're destroyed. They're wiped out. It's this incredible victory where the power of God's on display and the whole nation realizes that it's the God of Elijah, the God of creation, that's the one true God. It's an incredible victory. Chapter 19. Now, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life 
as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, she threatened to kill him. Verse 3. He was afraid. He arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and he sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now underline this phrase, he lay down and slept. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones, a jar of water. So he ate and drank, underline this phrase, he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and he ate and he drank. And went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to horror, the mountain of God. So understand what's going on in this passage. Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah, even though the God of of creation just showed himself able to save and deliver, showed himself by fire, Elijah was afraid. The question is why? And then Elijah put himself in a position of being alone, And Elijah prays to die. Why? It's because he's exhausted. He's exhausted physically. He's exhausted emotionally. He's exhausted spiritually. And it's in that exhausted and weary state that really he does some things that are unimaginable to a man of God. And what I want you to see in verses 5, it says twice that he... He slept. He needed to go to sleep. He needed to get physical rest. It says that he slept and then he ate and he drank water. He had to get nourishment back in his system. He had to hydrate his body. He was dehydrated. He was hungry and he was exhausted. Now as we understand this picture and this story, let me just share with you some things I want you to see. I want you to see that God was still present in his tired state. It's not like all of a sudden he got tired and God said, well, see you later. God was with him the whole time. Even when he was was there and he was fighting the victory against those 450 false prophets, God was there. When he ran away under the juniper tree by himself, tired and weary and exhausted, God was there. And God provided for him. You need to see that. God was still present in his tired state. But not only that, what I want you to see is that God responded to the things he asked in his tired, frightened, and alone state. When Elijah prays and he says, God, it's enough, kill me. Understand something. As a result of that prayer that he prays, God hears that prayer and God actually honors it. And it's not but a few chapters later that God takes him off the planet. God honors that request and literally God takes him off the planet. But it's all because of a prayer that he prayed when he was lonely, all right, hungry, and afraid. Be careful what you pray when you're hungry, lonely, and afraid. Because what you may end up doing is praying a prayer that you really don't mean to pray. See... What's interesting is if we were to keep reading in chapter 19, after Elijah eats, drinks, and sleeps, he's able to hear God more clearly after he rested. He journeys to Horeb and he sees and hears God clearly and directly and God speaks directly to him and he clearly understands God. But it was only after he was rested that God was able to do that. I also want you to see that God provided during both the weary and the rested periods. Before he got weary, God provided. When he was fighting against the false prophets, God provided. When he was weary and tired and alone, God provided. 
God always provides when we look to Him. The key is to run to Him. And what I want you to see in this passage is that even the most spiritual of people need rest. This isn't some ordinary person. This isn't just an everyday person who, who just like kind of does a little bit of ministry, might do a little bit for God, and they got tired. But, but, the, but the really spiritual people, they never get tired. That's not what this passage is showing. This is showing that, that even the most spiritual of people get tired. I don't care if you're a deacon at our church, you can get tired. I don't care if you're a pastor, you can get tired. I don't care if you're one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, you can get tired. Recently, um, a report came out from the Southern Baptist Convention. And um, basically, it was a report where, as Southern Baptist churches, we wanted to do... uh, an assessment on how we, as the Southern Baptist Convention, have addressed issues of sexual abuse uh, in Southern Baptist churches and and specifically in and through the convention. So research was done and analysis was done over the last year and a report was put out recently. And truthfully, church, it's not a good report. It shows some some very dark things for us as Southern Baptists. And, And it hurts me to say that but in this report it also draws out how some of the leaders in particular have maybe been more um, what's the word even um, participative in, in, in egregious things and a specific pastor is brought out by name in that report as being alleged of, of having uh, an instance of sexual abuse. This pastor has had a, a lifetime of ministry that's been exemplary. I mean, this is a major pastor of a major church in the convention. It's a pastor that, that has done incredible things for God. It's a pastor that's been a hero and a mentor to me um, from a distance for years. And... And what it brings out is allegations of his participation in a relationship 10 years ago that now is coloring his ministry. And what the report says and what he even acknowledges is that 10 years ago when he was finishing two back-to-back years or two back-to-back terms of service as the Southern Baptist Convention president where he was not only acting as the president, he was pastoring a church He was preaching on Sundays at his church and then preaching during the week at churches all over the United States. At the end of that period of time, he was exhausted and he was tired. And it was in that moment that the egregious incident happened. If that guy can fall, I can fall. You can fall. If Elijah needed rest, he needed rest. I need rest. You need rest. None of us is so spiritual that we don't need rest. God has demonstrated we need rest, and God has commanded us to rest. Rest is a very beneficial and powerful thing for us. And so listen, uh, unapologetically, when you came in today, you should have been given a card a little card for you and your family to have because tonight we're not going to have evening services tonight. But that's not so that you can go play and go fill up your schedule with all kinds of busyness. No, what we want to do is we want to help you learn to get rest. Um, I want you guys to go home after you eat a great lunch today and I want you to take a nap, right? A guy came up to me after the first service and he said, you know, I thought Sabbath rest was when somebody preaches or when somebody sleeps when when you preach, Brian. I guess that's a part of it. If I can help them go to bed, okay, praise the Lord. Some of you just woke up. Thanks for joining us. But I mean it. I, I, I want you to go home tonight and listen, I want you to clear your schedule tonight. I want you to take a nap. I want you, listen, sprawl out on the floor, put, put sleeping bags and blankets on the floor and just lay down as a family and take a nap together. Sprawl out, have just... Sleep. Turn the lights out. Close the blinds. Go to bed. Sleep. Physically 
refresh. Tonight, plan to go to sleep early all week long this week. Reestablish your wake-sleep schedule and, and fix, your, fix your sleep. Get the rest you need. Because rest is important and we all need it. So let me, let me give you some applications and we'll be done. Application number one. Rest is a sign of God's sovereignty and our faith. Rest is a sign of God's sovereignty in our faith. When, when we participate in, in rest and we stop working and we, we, we rest and we focus on God and we celebrate God, then listen to me, Sabbath is designed as a moment to stop and remember Him. We remember that He is the Creator. We remember that He is Lord and He is sovereign over us. We remember that He works to provide and to save us. And so that's what Sabbath does. It is a reminder that God is sovereign and that we serve Him and that He is the Creator and we are His creation. That is a part of our rest. But not only that, Sabbath is divine, designed for us to learn faith. We need to learn and put our faith in that God loves us and that God provides for us. And you see, when we stop working, we have to begin looking forward and saying, God, provide for me because I'm not working today. If you remember in the desert, right, God provided manna to the people every day except one. But the day before the day of rest, God provided double. God provided double the day before so that they didn't have to collect that day so that they could rest. The problem was some people didn't pay attention to what God said. So on the Sabbath, they went out to collect more manna and they realized there isn't any. God had already provided it the day before, but they didn't have the faith that God could provide if they didn't work. You see, faith is something that we aren't alone in this world. We need to learn through Sabbath that we're not alone, that, that it's not up to just me. There is a God in heaven who is real, and there's a God who is in heaven that's with us in this journey and with this life experience, and we can know him. The Sabbath is designed for us to learn faith, faith that even when we sleep, He doesn't. When I close my eyes, God does not. Some people ask me, Brian, how do you, how do you sleep so well at night? I sleep really well at night because I know that God isn't. When I close my eyes, I'm not worried about anything because, listen to me, God is awake. And the same God that protects me during the daytime when my eyes are open is the same God that protects me when I'm asleep at night. My wife will tell you, I sleep through hurricanes, no problem. <laughs> True story, right? Fireplaces shaking and rattling. Thunder's going on. Trees are blowing. I'm snoozing. Because <laughs> the same God that has his eyes on me during the daytime is the same God that has his eyes on me when I'm asleep. Amen. And that's an issue of faith. Trusting that God is at work even when I'm not. That God is providing and protecting even when my eyes are closed. That's an issue of faith. Secondly, true rest requires more than sleep. When we talk about Sabbath rest, there is a physical component to it, but True rest requires more than just physical sleep. God's rest is ultimately experienced when we're in His presence. There is coming a moment when we are going to step out of this life and we are going to enter into our rest. In other words, when we get into His presence, this life will be over. Our responsibility to work, our opportunity to work, it will be done and we will truly rest. Stop working. But listen to me. Right now is our time to work. We are in a work-rest cycle, and this is the work cycle for us. God has given us spiritual gifts. God has given us natural talents. God has given us purpose. God has given us direction. God has given us opportunity. We are to be about His work right now. And so now... We have to understand that ultimately, Sabbath is only experienced when we're in His presence. And so, once a week, on the seventh day, true Sabbath rest is when we spend time in God's presence. It's not when we just stop working, but we stop working and we come into His presence. And we can experience some of what will come right now. We can be in His presence and experience 
not just physical rest, but spiritual rest. God is the source of our energy, and we take physical renewal from physical rest, but ultimately we need and should long for spiritual renewal, and that only comes from God in his presence. Number three, rest helps you walk in obedience. Rest helps you walk in obedience. When a person is tired, they're not able to focus at their optimum level. That's true. Study after study tells us that. Fatigue and weariness open the door for fear. Remember what happened with Elijah? Even though he had had this great mountaintop victory, victory over 450 false prophets, one on 450, and he won. In the exhaustion of that, it opened the door for him to be afraid of the accusations of one woman. And the accusations of that woman led him to move to a place where he was alone, where he was tired, hungry, thirsty, and praying for death. That's a terrible place to be. See, fatigue diminishes our stamina. And we need stamina to fight the battles to be obedient. Obedience requires energy and fight. We're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. And what we need to do is have the energy and the awareness to fight the battle to gain the victory, right? And when we gain the victory, stop, rest, and refuel and and renew so that you can go fight the next fight because it's coming. And finally, number four, any work or activity that degrades Sabbath should be viewed as dangerous. Any work or activity that degrades Sabbath should be viewed as dangerous. If there's any activity that pulls you away from rest and Sabbath observance, be on guard. Be on guard. You're in a dangerous position and you may find yourself running away from God and alone, afraid of evil more than you are confident in God. Now, Christy's here. And Christy can verify this. Let me share with you how this played out in our family. Um, Many of you know that our our children have been very uh, active in sports. Um, As our boys were growing up, we saw them excelling in sports. They played multiple sports, and one of which was baseball. And we we saw them growing in their capacity to play baseball. And so we felt like if they were really going to have a chance to play at the next level and maybe play in high school and then in college, that we, we felt like they needed to play travel ball. The problem with travel ball is that the competitions are on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Tough, right? For me, I'm preaching on Sundays. Well, the way most of those tournaments worked where we lived was you would play seating on Saturday, and your, your, your success on Saturday determined which bracket you were in on Sunday. And so we had this dilemma. Are we going to play or are we not going to play? Are we going to let the kids just go after travel ball or not? And so Christian and I prayed through it, and we said, listen, God's ordained the Sabbath. We need to teach our kids that it's important to be present and rest and focus on God and remember that our priorities are God first. So we talked to the boys. We said, boys, you realize that if you play travel ball, your dad's probably not going to be there on Sundays because he's preaching. They're like, we understand. We said, boys, you realize that that you can't play travel ball on Sundays unless you go to church. We understand. You're willing to miss games on Sundays because you're going to be at church rather than being at the field. We understand. Okay. If you understand those those prerequisites, then, then... Okay, we'll play travel ball. And so we, we play travel ball. First couple tournaments come and Saturdays come and the boys play. They do great. And then Sunday rolls around. And they're in the championship bracket and the games are at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Christy looks at me and says, Brian, the games are during church. Oh, okay. Well, let's call the coach and tell them the boys won't be there. 
And I can remember the coach saying, what do you mean they're not going to be here? We, we wanted your boys to pitch. We wanted your boys to play. They were supposed to be in the lineup. If, if they're not here, how are we going to do this? And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. They need to go to church. They need to make sure that they honor the Lord and have Sabbath. And those are some hard first tournaments. And, and then we had to draw the line in some sand at some things. Because... Any activity that pulls you away from rest and Sabbath observance, we need to be on guard with. And see, listen to what happens. If we're not careful, we, we say, hey, you know what? Go hunting. Go fishing. Go, go do what you want on Sundays. And, and what did you just do? Sunday becomes a day that's about you. Sunday's a day for you to celebrate what you want and to do what you care about. And you have just replaced God on Sunday. And when you replace God as your focus on Sundays, you've just become an idol. You worship yourself in your time. And what you want to do is becoming idolatrous. You're like, Brian, that's a very harsh statement. No, that's a very accurate statement. Now, were we perfect in that? No. There were some days our boys played. And Christy and I struggled with that. But by God's grace, we tried to honor the Lord's Sabbath as often as we could because it, it is a mandate to us as believers. And we had to be on extremely strong guard because we're in a d dangerous position. Because before you know it, if you just keep using the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week to do what you want, you may find yourself further away from God and alone and living in fear more than you're walking by faith. And that's a dangerous place to be. Amen. So church, over the next few weeks, I want to do my best as your pastor to walk you through some things that are going to help you refresh. Today needs to be a day of rest. This week needs to be a day and a time of rest. I want to strongly encourage you, clear your schedule today. Take a nap today. Okay? Don't get busy and don't, don't fill your day with lots of strenuous activity. Don't stay up late tonight. Plan to get to bed early and all week long. Let God minister to you through a Sabbath rest. Amen.